So yeah, I'm going to talk about the state of diversity in open source communities. Um, I want to be really clear that these are only correlations. I am not claiming any causal links one way or another. Um, we can we can certainly talk about what they might be, but the the methodologies used are not such that I really feel comfortable claiming any causal links. Um, and yep. Uh, this is me. This is Boo. She is my co-presenter. You may recognize her from the morning's keynote where she was hanging out with Gris. Uh, she's, she's really good on stage. Uh, so yeah, I'm Holden. My preferred pronouns are she or her. I'm a developer advocate at Google. I'm on the Spark PMC, uh, which means it's really hard to get me off of the Spark project, which is good because I like Spark. Um, and I contribute to a lot of other Apache projects. Um, I've worked at a whole bunch of other companies. Uh, they were all very nice people and paid me money. Um, I'm a co-author of two books, which are unrelated to any of the content discussed here, but that should not stop you from buying them, um, especially high-performance Spark. I got a much better royalty deal on that one. It turns out you can negotiate. Um, if anyone's interested in sort of seeing open source code reviews live streamed, um, I think it's more interesting than watching paint dry. You may disagree. Uh, you can check out my YouTube channel here, uh, and you can sort of see um, the thought process that goes into at least how I do my open source code reviews. Um, and sometimes people join, and, and there's chats, and people find issues that I wouldn't have found, and we get to have those conversations. Um, I've got a bunch of random Spark videos, because that's a lot of what I do as well. Um, in addition to who I am professionally, I'm trans, queer, Canadian in America on an H-1B work visa that expires on April 2020. I should figure out which day, because um, that's coming up, uh, and part of the leather community. And this is actually more related to this talk than normal. Um, normally, I'm talking about Spark, and I'm just like, and we should, you know, talk about where we're all from. But I think, actually, it's really important for us to talk about where we're all from in open source communities, because that's sort of the first step to understanding what our community looks like. And if we don't know what our community looks like, we don't know um, if we need to improve diversity or what sort of facets we might want to think about. So if you're an, in an open source community, I encourage you to have these conversations with other people, um, You know, especially if you're in the project management of it, like where they're all from, what their backgrounds are, what people's biases might be. Um, and so it's a, it's a good conversation. Um, and so obviously, this gives me a set of biases um, the exact details of which are like, I believe universal healthcare is amazing. Um, and I am slightly terrified for the immigration changes happening in America and, and other things like this, right? Um, but you know, th this gives me one set of views and another set of views could be important too. Um, so yeah, uh, what is this all about? Uh, open source is really important. You're all here at a conference about it, so that's probably something you already care about. Um, and there's also, the other part is, there's not a lot of metrics around diversity in open source communities. Um, there's, there's some, and, and I linked to some of them uh, at the end for some of the other studies, um, but it's also this wishful thinking that maybe if we actually measure some of these metrics, maybe we can do better, right? Maybe the act of measuring will cause us to find ways to improve, right? There's this old saying that what gets measured is what gets improved, and I think this can be true in open source communities as well. Um, also, I want to be clear, like, uh, these analytics, like, they're they're in my GitHub. Um, I'm certainly a mediocre data scientist. I mostly make tools for data scientists. Um, so if you are someone who really likes doing data analytics, uh, please join me, and, and I would love to do more interesting analytics here. Um, OK, and so with that, I don't know if any of you read the news, um, but perhaps my employer has perhaps not had the best, most recent reputation about certain aspects of which I'm going to be discussing. Um, I enjoy being paid, and I work in what's called an at-will state. Um, so that is all I'm going to say about that. Uh, but uh, to be really clear, I'm wearing my personal hat. Um, that is not my Google hat, right? Um, I, I'm very grateful for Google for supporting this work, uh, but these are definitely my own personal views and not necessarily those of Google. Google may disagree with some of my thoughts. Uh, cool. So one of, one of the things that, that I found really fascinating, um, sort of that, that motivated me to do some of these analytics, was I was reading this book called The Good Girl's Revolt, uh, which is about the equal 
Employment Opportunities Commission in America in the 60s, um, and one of the one of the things that uh, people said in response to some of the complaints there, um, and it was writers come to the magazine over the transom, and women aren't coming. We can't do anything if they aren't interested. Has anyone heard something similar to that in our open source communities? Yeah, and that's that's a lot of nodding heads. Um, for those of you watching the recording, you can trust me on this one. Um, but even if you don't, uh, we can see RMS perhaps saying something pretty similar about Emacs and GCC, right? Um, and so I, I think that there's this belief that, you know, it's not our problem, it's just that people aren't interested. Um, and I think I think some of these analytics might suggest that that's not the case, right? Um, there are some recent studies. Um, this was this one's depressing. Um, researchers found women's coding suggestions were accepted 71% of the time when their gender was kept secret, and 62% of the time when their gender was revealed. Ooh. I mean, that's that's a difference. Um, and also, there there was just like 25% uh, of the women surveyed uh, reported being exposed to language or content that made them uncomfortable. Now, that's that's definitely a thing with cross-cultural communication that can happen unintentionally. Uh, certainly, I have occasionally made people uncomfortable by saying uh, certain words um, that rhyme with truck um, because I don't know. Uh, to me, it's very normal, but to other people, it makes them feel very uncomfortable, and I, I try and not do this, um, but it's, it's a thing. Um, and this is one of the things which actually made me wonder, maybe there's something in the language of a project which might be correlated with project diversity. Maybe there's something there. I should do some analytics here and try and explore this. Um, so, what have we done? Uh, and so it's just me and Boo on stage, and well, I love Boo, she didn't do any of the programming. Um, I had some, some lovely help, and, and there's a call outside to that later. Uh, but so when I use we, it's not the royal we, I'm not that <coughs> into myself. Um, but so we pulled data from Git, uh, Meetup, and we did some machine learning, also known as statistics, but with less principles. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then I also used some humans because I was like, you know what, uh, maybe I should do some surveys, uh, that might be kind of interesting. And we made some pretty-ish pictures. They weren't very good, but I did find a lot of cat pictures. Um, so just sort of average out the cuteness of the cat and the graph on all of the slides and, and this will be okay. All right, so to be clear, this is this is just correlation. This is not causation. Um, this is also not legal advice or academic quality data. Uh, lawyer cat would be very upset um, if I was implying that uh, any of these things were legal advice. And, and my reference to the EEOC was simply uh, for comparison, in no way implying that there could be any direct relationship here. Please don't sue me or my boss. Okay, uh, moving on. So. Git commits, messages, uh, we inferred gender, we got humans to review projects and guess at the gender of the participants based on the information about the participants. We looked at project websites, mailing lists, and then there's this bit.ly link which takes you uh, to the GitHub where all of this lives. Um, and, and pull requests are actually welcome, for real. Uh, okay, cool, so what does what was the data? Uh, so I looked at about 50 projects, um, 30 gigs of commits and posts from those projects. Um, the human review was obviously sampled down because my budget was limited to that of what I thought I could uh, put on my corporate card without my boss noticing, which is about $100. Um, so there was $100 worth of human review. Uh, I actually did it three times, so it was it was. $300 worth of human review, uh, but spread out over a few months, so it's, uh, planning. Um, <laughs> and if you're watching this, Eric, uh, I'm sorry, and thanks for approving those expense reports. Um, <laughs> Okay, cool. Uh, and then, okay, then we also, we had slightly different data that we used for the country contributions and we looked at 11 gigs worth of commits for that. Um, and we also only looked at individuals with at least one commit in a one year window from the time that I took the snapshot of the data. Um, and so that narrowed it down enough that I could afford to do this with under $300. It's not a very principled window, it was just, this was the window that gave me um, work with my budget. The human data collection uh, 
was done with these instructions that are, are certainly not perfect. Um, and it depends on the cultural bias of random humans from the internet who I can hire from a uh, website whose name I'm not going to mention because I enjoy being employed. Um, but we, we asked them to find the gender of the user in question. Uh, we gave them some sample emails that had been sent in response to the user on the mailing list. Um, so this, this brings in the bias of other people on the mailing list, but the hope was that maybe people in the project would use the correct pronouns for the people they were interacting with, especially if they'd been on the project for a while. Um, and so, so the hope was they, a human reviewer could extract that information. Um, and then we also told them to free, freely to search online. Um, and we tried to infer LinkedIn and Twitter information uh, for users. Some people list it um, in their like ASF stuff, but that only really worked for the very prolific contributors. The, the smaller contributors tended to have less information in their profile. So there's definitely some bias introduced uh, there as well. And uh, then we also asked them to list to all of the th resources that they use to try and infer this user's gender so that uh, when I another month goes by, I can pay someone else $100 uh, on that corporate card to look through the data and do a, do a double check. But I, I have to wait for the next billing cycle to come around. Otherwise, Eric is going to start to get suspicious. Uh, so step one, any, any good data scientist starts with eyeballing. Well, OK, at least I always start with eyeballing because I don't know what the hell I'm doing. So let's take a look at what some of this data looks like. Um, so if we group together by project, um, and we look at the inferred non-male percentage and the sampled non-male percentage. Um, and so we asked people, you know, what gender people were, and, and um, there was only one person in the entire data set who came back uh, as non-binary. Everyone else was male or female. Um, that represents, obviously, the bias of the reviewers to a degree, um, but that's, that's why non-male rather than female. Um, and we can see there's, there's a really tall bar and so that, that's an exciting tall bar. Um, there's also another bar in here, uh, which is not from the ASF. So I also looked at some, some projects from Jupyter because I wanted to see like maybe the ASF is doing really well or really poorly. Um, and the Jupyter projects uh, tend to be doing a little bit better than the ASF projects in terms of diversity, um, which is, is interesting. Um, there could be something at a foundation level there. Um, but then there's also CouchDB uh, is an ASF project, relatively high diversity for, for these projects. Um, and they actually do a bunch of explicit outreach as well, uh, which, which could be correlated. Um, hopefully their explicit outreach actually does have some effect, and, and that's what we're seeing reflected here in the data. Uh, but it could also be something else. Um, and right, yeah, so there are limitations that apply. This may under or over count in certain situations because it's sampled and um, computers are terrible. Okay, so what is that really tall bar? Um, it's this project called Rivata. I don't actually know how to pronounce it. It's an Apache project, apparently. I found that out by going to their website. No, um, I found that out because it was in my data set. And they've, they've got this list of people working on it. Uh, it's kind of neat. Uh, they actually list the time zones on their like, people working on this page, which I thought was kind of cool um, from like a collaboration point of view. That seems kind of useful information to know. I happen to know that in the Spark community for the people that I work with. Um, but certainly, you know, in new projects, I'm just like, I don't know who's awake. Uh, let me just try pinging random humans. Um, so there are some things that like could be unique about that project, right? Uh, one of the things is if we if we look at the people, uh, they're coming from a wide variety of of different organizations uh, relative to perhaps uh, the project that I work on, Apache uh, Spark, which might be a little bit more concentrated with one or two key employers, as it were. Um, it has an easy to find community page. There's really good instructions on how to get involved directly from the project homepage. And also, interestingly enough, um, it has a lot of academic backing. Um, so there was a knowledge of, of National Science Foundation backing. And so maybe that encouraged more people sort of from uh, academia to get involved, and maybe that helped improve these numbers. Um, they also participated in Google Summer of Code, which was kind of interesting. And maybe that was another way that they got people involved. Um, so that's, those, those are some things, you know, um, this isn't like a very <coughs> statistically significant sample. We're looking at one project, but certainly we're looking at the one project which definitely stood out the most. So that's kind of cool. Um, but stage two, we're going to apply science to this. Um, and science is when we empty a beer can, 
into something else, and then we go back in time. Uh, okay, the Back to the Future didn't was not so popular in Germany. <laughs> okay, it was. My jokes are just bad. That's fine. Okay, so. That's great, but I don't really have the time to go and dig into every individual project at scale, right? That uh, would cost more than my $300 budget, um, and I'm lazy. So uh, these are some of the things that we could programmatically figure out to a degree. Um, and I'd use humans to, to look and see if there was a code of conduct um, and the contributor guide. Um, but we can look at things like um, the sentiment of the project on the user dev list using sentiment analysis, and maybe we'll see something interesting there with the language based on our, our earlier study about uh, women tending to experience language that made them uncomfortable. So maybe there's something there. Um, so there's some gender-related attributes that we can think of. We can think of the gender percentages of the code contributions. We could look at the mailing list users. There's a lot of mailing list users, and coming up with a statistically significant sample of them cost more than $300. Sorry, I didn't do it. Um, and we can also look at the gender percentages of the project management group and the people who are committing code. And then we can look and see which one of these are correlated with different things, and, and we can maybe this will tell us happy things. So um, I did both sampled and inferred gender information. If you look at these two graphs, you'll notice they're different, um, which is not great. Um, this points to perhaps either data quality with humans or data quality with machines. One of the two is perhaps less than ideal, but there, there are some similarities, and let's dive into to one of those graphs and take a look. Uh, oh, actually, wait, let's talk about why this might be uh, the case. Uh, so inferred gender is known to have a lot of issues, especially with non-American uh, names. Um, they tend to pull from like historical census data, and so it also is biased towards like older names. Um, trans folks, like the computer is going to say that I'm a dude. Um, I mean, to be fair, like 20% of people will too, but you know, eh, there's, there's some bias there too. Um, it could also be the, the place where they differed uh, was on the, the impact of sentiment to a degree. Um, it could be that our sentiment detection is off. I don't, I don't think so. I think the sentiment detection is probably okay. Uh, but if you've got an idea of different things we should explore on sentiment detection, uh, definitely let me know. But uh, yeah, so what's our, what's our first look? So we can see that uh, positive sentiment is correlated with increased diversity, and negative sentiment is to a degree negatively, oh, well, okay, I can see that. Uh, we'll look at another graph where we have these labels readable. Um, but if, if you trust me, uh, negative sentiment is negatively correlated, and we can see there's slightly different amounts of correlation depending on exactly which thresholds we're using for considering a mailing list bad. Um, and then there's also, Depressingly, um, the existence of a mentoring guide is negatively correlated, um, which was surprising. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that more later. Um, and perhaps in, in a nice way, we do see that the inferred non-male percentage and the sampled non-male percentages are strongly correlated together. If they weren't, I would be very worried about our data quality. But they are strongly correlated, so even though there are some questions around data quality, it is good enough for, uh, for me. So if we, if we just focus on mailing lists, uh, we can see that the average negative sentiment and the 90th quantile negative sentiment are both negatively correlated with increased diversity on a uh, project. Um, and the positive ones are, are also positively correlated. Um, so, I mean, this doesn't necessarily give us a causal link, right? Like, maybe more diverse projects tend to have more neutral or positive sentiment in that, you know, we may just be aware that we're communicating across cultural boundaries, like how I learned not to say things that rhyme with truck. Um, or it could be that, you know, people are turned away from this uh, when they see negative things on the mailing list. It's, it's hard to say which one it is, um, but I would encourage you to, to use this information to um, perhaps get rid of the assholes on your mailing list insofar as you can, because uh, they probably weren't adding a lot anyways, and it might help you increase the diversity of your project. Uh, okay, so the, the committer guide, that one was sad. Um, 
Uh, okay, so on 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 a positive side, non-male committer percentage is strongly correlated with increased diversity of contributors, um, and this could just be that we're like pulling from that contributor pool to make our committers, um, and that's good, right? Like, if this was not strongly correlated, that would make me sad. That would mean that we're not like pulling from that pool. We're just pulling from the pool of of dudes. Um, and so this is this is good, or it could also be that having non-male committers tends to attract more non-male contributors. Who knows? But uh, yeah, whatever. It's cool. Uh, on inferred data, it looks pretty similar, but the the exact values are a little bit different. Um, and so that's that's reassuring to a degree. It's it's not quite the same, but it's you know it's good. Um, so yeah, interestingly enough, the code of conduct being explicitly declared on the project page uh, was was not correlated. It was just neutral. Um, and this this could be that we're pulling from ASF projects, right? Um, all ASF projects are like part of the Apache Software Foundation, which does have a code of conduct. So it, it could just be like kind of neutral when your project says it, because like in practice, yeah, we're all supposed to be not assholes to each other. Um, or maybe it's something else. Uh, the mentoring guide one really confused me. Um, I don't have a good explanation for that, but that's okay. You you all can come up with a reason for that. This does not mean go delete your mentoring guides. Um, this just means like maybe take a look at them. Maybe the mentoring guides tend to have language which makes people not happy. Maybe there's something there in our mentoring guides that we should dig into and see uh, what's going on. Maybe there's there's some opportunities for improvement there. Um, so one of the other things that I was curious about is the impact of programming language. Um, and this did not match my expectations at all when I made this chart yesterday. Um, well, actually, technically this morning, because uh, I reran it because I didn't trust myself. Um, but we can see here that uh, some languages are, you know, they, they seem to have uh, higher percentages. So this is, I should, I should explain, this is the programming language, and this is the min, max, and average of the projects that are have that as the primary programming language of what their diversity numbers are on gender. Um, and Python is just zero across the board, which is not the answer I was expecting, right? Um, and one of the things is that this is actually just on the ASF data. It's not on the Jupyter data. Um, if it was on the Jupyter data and it gave me back zero across the board, I would have been like, hmm, well, then it's time to delete that graph. Uh, but if, if we dig into this, we can see there's not a lot of um, Apache projects with Python as their primary detected language. Uh, so each project was only assigned one language, and it was whichever one GitHub decided to assign to it, which we all know is perfect. Um, but, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, one could argue that, that Spark really should be Scala and Python, uh, and then we'd, we'd get different numbers, but uh, this was the, the easier approach. And so since there's only like one or two projects in the Python one, I think we should probably just discount this uh, field, and we can look at the other ones. The other ones all have some reasonable number of projects uh, in them. Um, and this is interesting. Uh, we can see that there is certainly a fair amount of variance inside of some languages. Um, so we can see that uh, there are uh, more diverse Scala projects and less diverse Scala projects. So it's not simply a matter of reflecting the programming language that we're pulling from. Uh, we can certainly see that there's a difference between the min and the max and, and the average there. Uh, so that's kind of interesting, right? We can't just use the programming language excuse and just be like, nah, no one likes Java. Because uh, it turns out some people really do who, who aren't male and, and they contribute to ASF projects, right? And that's, that's really awesome. And so it's not just that we use Java a lot. Um, not that there's anything wrong with Java. Well, there is a lot. Um, <laughs> but, okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, so, so the other question which I had, um, because how many of you have become a committer on an Apache project? Okay, keep your hands up if you felt that process was fair and easy. Okay, so it got cut by half, 
Uh, and so one of the things that I was curious is, you know, perhaps it's, it's possible that because uh, many projects tend to submit, uh, tend to select committers by consensus voting, um, that maybe we're allowing biases to unintentionally creep into that process, right? Um, consensus voting is like everyone agrees, no one vetoes, um, and this is how you end up eating at, uh, in America, the Olive Garden. Um, or, sorry, no, no, the Cheesecake Factory. Cheesecake Factory. Uh, okay, you do not have Olive Garden or Cheesecake Factory here, um, but it's how you end up eating somewhere really bland and mediocre, right? When you're just like all of your friends, anyone who has any objection can just be like, no, right? And so maybe this is leading to blander um, project makeup. Uh, it looks like maybe not so much. We, we tend to see, right, as, as we saw in that correlation slide earlier, that the, uh, there, there is a correlation between the number of non-male contributors and the number of non-male committers. Um, and we, we tend to see that broken out for most projects. Um, some of them, though, are certainly very different. Um, and if you want, you can look at this graph uh, later with like a magnifying glass. Uh, or you can go to the, the, the bit.ly link where the, the notebook is and you can, you can look at this graph specifically. Uh, yeah, all right, cool. So gender is one of many aspects of diversity of a project. Um, there's also where people are from. Um, and it turns out there are a lot of people from Germany, so uh, good job. Um, I, the US is probably undercounted here on the basis of that whole dot-com thing, uh, which was just blew everything out of the water, but dot-com is, is sufficiently popular for just all commercial organizations, regardless of country, that it, it was kind of difficult to figure out where folks were from. Um, and so this is this is kind of interesting. Uh, we see this this trail off. Canada's here. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else from Canada? Yay! Go team. Okay. Um, so like Canada's in the top five, and like as Canadians, I feel like that's the Canadian version of gold. Um, so you know, you don't want to be number one, right? Because then that's that's just oof, that's a lot of apologies. Um, <laughs> Uh, sorry, cultural stereotypes. Um, but they're, they're for my own culture, so I think it's okay. That's how it works, right? Anyway, okay, moving on. Um, okay, and so if we, if we take uniques rather than just looking at all of the contributions, right, so if, like, I contribute 100 patches to, to Spark as, uh, you know, do we count me as one or 100 if, if we do this? Um, the, the graph ends up looking pretty much the same. So it, it turns out that it's not just like there's a, a bot in Germany that's contributing hundreds of thousands of patches. Uh, well, there may be, but that's not the only reason why. Or if there is, that bot is changing its email address a lot, uh, and you're probably going to get banned from the GitHub API. So, okay. Uh, so this is, this is kind of interesting there, too. Um, and there's, there's a lot of other facets that we could explore here besides gender, but they're all really hard. Um, and when you have a budget of about whatever you can sneak past your boss, it's not a great budget, right? And so I really think that if we should explore um, a lot of these things. We, we often talk about diversity of employers in Apache projects, um, and I, I think that would be a good thing for us to explicitly study outside of just, you know, PMC and committers. I think it makes sense to look where the contributions on the mailing list are coming from. Um, I think certainly all of these other facets are all really exciting too, and we should, we should explore them, but I can't do it for $300. Um, and so if anyone was, say, perhaps asking the ASF for money to do diversity work, you know, maybe this could be an interesting area that we could use to figure out uh, where or how we should focus our efforts to truly reflect the world that we're serving. Um, there's a whole bunch of related work, and it's all really depressing. Um, but if you're tired of being happy, I encourage you to check out these links. Um, or as I like to say, uh, everything is uh, awesome. Yes, yes, awesome. Right, I don't actually... Um, if you want to see videos of a Spark committer struggling to use Spark, uh, there's this lovely bit.ly link down at the bottom uh, wherein I try and use the software that I've worked on for six years. Uh, and it turns out that the software that I've worked on is 
has some opportunities for improvement, to <laughs> use a phrase that I've uh, seen every performance review. Um, and so you can check that out there. Um, and hopefully that, that, that makes you feel confident enough that you can help contribute to doing these analytics uh, with me. Um, and special thanks. Uh, this wasn't just me. There were many lovely people uh, and Spencer, who is my former O'Reilly editor. Um, she's the head of content at Domino Data Lab, did a lot of early work with me on this. Um, Matt gave an earlier version of this talk with me uh, and pointed out that the graphs looked like shit. Um, they still do, but less so. And I added cat pictures, so that helps, right? Um, and, and Gris did the geographic analysis, um, which is, is very useful. Um, if you want to participate, please come and join me. Um, doing this work by yourself is a really good way to feel really sad about the world. Um, and if you get multiple people together working on diversity stuff, when you burn out, you know, you've got someone else to talk to. Uh, so that's useful, uh, you, but you might burn out. Um, just fair warning. Uh, and you can say, hi, I'm going to be around Berlin for the next few days. Um, and if I manage to do like one business meeting uh, between now and when I leave, it'll look a lot less sketchy on my expense reports. Uh, otherwise, eh, uh, I'll swing by the, the Beam Summit. Um, okay, so as a book author um, of a book that is admittedly completely unrelated to this talk, I would be remiss if I did not try and tell you about my book. You should buy it. Okay, great. Um, moving on. Uh, if anyone is interested in teaching distributed computing to children, um, and and this is this is not a joke. This is actually a project that I'm working on. Um, distributed computing for kids dot com. You can give me your email address, and because you're European, I won't spam you. I will selectively contact you for business related reasons. <laughs> Uh, and there is an unsubscribe link, um, as mandated by law. Um, anyways, I think we can teach Apache Spark to children, preferably children who live in Europe, not America, so I don't have to answer their questions. Um, and so that is my hope there. Um, okay, so I wanted to save the last of it for Q&A, and we can discuss these analytics, we can look at the notebook, and you can see my really janky Python code. Um, know that I'm a Scala developer, so that's my excuse, but uh, does, does anyone have questions? I, I, would, I would love to, or, or thoughts. Questions? Anyone? Oh, sad. Clearly, I am just an amazing public speaker uh, who has answered everyone's possible questions. Yes? Does anyone want to look at a mediocre Python notebook? Yes. Oh. <laughs> that is not the answer I was expecting. OK. Here is a mediocre Python notebook. Uh, OK, yeah. Uh, so we can go up to the top. Uh, okay, Ooh, we'll ignore all of the Spark setup stuff because it's terrible. Uh, okay, more Spark setup, more Spark setup. Oh, some things that really should be functions in Spark. Moving past that. Okay, uh, here's where we extract the meetup data, which I never got around to or, uh, analyzing. If anyone wants to analyze the meetup data, um, I have a bunch of it. Um, I think it would be interesting to see if maybe like having meetups in different countries is correlated with any of these things. I think that could be a thing which might actually be really relevant. Um, yeah, and so there's a bunch of it that's just commented out because I didn't do that. Uh, we use Percival to extract a lot of data from GitHub. Thank you, GitHub, for not blocking me. I really appreciate that, uh, although they do occasionally. If you run this notebook on your own, uh, be prepared to be rate limited by GitHub. Uh, but they don't, they don't turn your account off. Not a guarantee. Uh, OK. Save our data. Super happy fun times. I import a Python library, which is actually secretly a jar, because I use Spark. Um, we look at some users. There's these two, Grant and Carl. What's up? Um, then we use regular expressions to parse email addresses because I hate my life. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, 
Um, we also try and extract names from email addresses because I was going to try and do some analytics on the mailing list. But that regular expression had some opportunities for improvement. Um, so if you like writing regular expressions, come join me. Uh, we look at the distinct authors. Um, we look up GitHub users by email address, so we, we get their commits, and then we go and we find their GitHub profile to try and get any information that might be present about them. Um, we also fetch their user bio. Some people put their pronouns in their bio. Please put your pronouns in your bio. It's really helpful when I run this pipeline. Um, but also, it's, it's just good, and it, it sort of normalizes that process, which I think would be, would be good for the world. Uh, we have this really high-quality UDF that just uh, yeah, that, that sleep rand int. Mm. Uh, that's some quality stuff. Um, this gets the language for a project. Um, so we get the committees, and then we get their languages. Um, I use this thing called known blocking DF save or load, also known as my notebook keeps crashing. Um, and so I just want to save them. It's uh, terrible, uh, but it works. Uh, aggregate a bunch of data. Oh, yeah, I tried to scrape Crunchbase, but uh, yeah, as this comment says, robots.txt seems to be OK with it for now. Uh, last checked April 4th. Uh, since then, um, I don't think they are anymore, so it's commented out. Uh, we don't actually run that extraction anymore. I think they got um, frustrated. Uh, but Crunchbase had a bunch of information about uh, open source contributors for some reason. I don't know who put that information in there, but thanks get their information, do a bunch of stuff with it, check that my sentiment analyzer uh, correctly detects the difference in sentiment between these two sentences. Um, and then we extract sentiment across all of the mailing list posts for a project. Yay. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of repartitioning because this is Spark and life is terrible. Ignore the exceptions. Uh, once again, this is Spark. That exception actually means everything is going OK. <laughs> uh, that's on my to fix list. OK, uh, we do a bunch more shit, we do a bunch more shit. <laughs> uh, more, more. Well, I'll let you know when I find something interesting again. OK. Oh, right, we compute the, the sample sizes so that they're like actually statistically significant. Um, what's there? Oh, yeah, and then this is where I computed the sum of the sample size to make sure I could do it under budget, and I kept changing the constraints uh, until I got a input that resulted in a small enough sample size. So that's how we ended up with the one-year window. Um, and then we do a bunch of other stuff. Uh, but I'm down to five minutes left, so if you want, you can read this notebook. I actually have a question. Oh, cool. cool. Um, do you have tips to actively make your project or the meetups, et cetera, more diverse? That's a great question. Uh, I don't. Um, I, I, so I think working with groups like Outreachy can be really good. Um, if you're organizing like physical events, making sure they're in accessible locations, maybe doing things that aren't just drinking after work, because uh, I feel hella uncomfortable getting drunk with a bunch of programmers that I don't know. Um, and I imagine there are other people who also have similar comfort challenges around that. Um, there's, there, there are good resources about that. This is all just correlations, though. Um, and I don't, I, I was hoping if I stuck to correlations, I wouldn't get yelled at. Uh, so I, I don't want to go too much to specific advice. But you should talk to Gris, who is sitting right behind you uh, <laughs> when the camera is not running. And, and she can, or you can ask me again when the camera is not running. But that works, too. Um, did you, maybe I missed it, but did you get a chance to like look at the diversity by country? Like, do certain countries do better than other countries? Oh, no, I didn't. That's a great next thing to do. Yeah, that'd be it's cool to see. One group by away. <laughs> Pull requests, welcome. <laughs> Talk to you this afternoon. <laughs> Yay! I'm going to go get lunch, but after that, I'll be back if you want to, if you actually want to. Cool. Okay. Uh, that's, I think we're good, yeah? Awesome, thank you very much, Holden. Yeah. No, thanks everyone for coming.